We're excited that you've joined us today as we begin a study on the life and character of Samuel. And so we're looking forward to spending some time with you today as we look at his life. Hey, I'm Marcus Bellamy. I'm the pastor of spiritual development here at First Baptist Church. And I'm joined by Jacob Bain. And so we're so glad that, uh, Jacob, you have joined me today to talk about the life of Samuel. Take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. Thanks for letting me be here. Uh, my name is Jacob. Um, I work on the television staff here or the, t the media ministry staff. At the same time, also one of the teachers out in the Crossroads Young Adult Ministry. So that's, that, uh, that's enough, I think. An incredible teacher and uh, just very gifted on the media side and just your understanding of the scriptures. So I'm looking forward to growing with you today and discussing the life of Samuel. Hey, before we talk about Samuel's life, let's talk about uh, what was going on during this time. We know Samuel, a prophet, a priest, a judge. And we know a lot about Samuel simply because there's books in his name. And yet at the same time, the situation that was going on during this time, uh, there were plenty of leadership failures. An example of one of the leadership failures uh, in that time frame was Samson. And Samson's life was an example of not only did his leadership failure impact him, but it also impacted the people he led. Would you take a few moments and share with us what are some additional details about this time period and what was going on at the time that Samuel comes on the scene? Yeah, I mean, context is always important. Mm -hmm. And so I think even to back it up a little bit more, like you had the book of Judges, but before that you had the book of Joshua, which is mm -hmm. one of the most successful books in the, the Old Testament just because it's where you know, the Israel goes in as a nation and they take back the promised land. And you know a few mistakes, but overall it's just uh, gigantically, is that a word? Successful. Uh, and then it's immediately followed by this book of just one of the most unsuccessful times of Israel, the book of Judges, where it's 350 years of, uh, oh, we're doing great, so we don't need God. Oh no, something's happening. Oh God, help us. And then he helps us and then we forget him again. It's just a cyclical thing and it's just if anything if anything it starts ingraining this uh, tradition into Israel not on not by God's design but that they just rely on God when they need him and that's it and then they call him almost like as a lucky charm hey help us out God sends a judge to to deal with the situation they reply they respond to that judge um, but then they they forget after the judge has moved on and it had even uh, worked its way up into the, the priesthood. You know, there was one nation that was set apart, apart to be the priest. <clears throat> and Eli, the high priest at the time, he had two sons, and they were corrupt. And all of Israel knew they were corrupt. Um, they would take the choice parts from the offerings. They would uh, sleep with the women that came to serve at the, the, the holy place, etc. And all of Israel knew it. And if anything, it was causing this negative reaction of, I don't even want to come and offer my offering because I know it's not going to get be treated right, so what's the point? And, I mean, how, how would you want to be known as the guy that pushed people away from God? Because that's what Eli's sons were doing, and that's just how corrupt the nation was at this point. Um, so, yeah, they were pretty dire straits right now. So in the midst of a lot of disobedience, God has a righteous remnant. Boy, is that applicable and encouraging for us today, thinking about... God having a righteous remnant. We look at the chaos in our culture. We see it seems as though the train has left the track. The wheels are falling off the bus. And yet you're here and I'm here and you're here. God has left a righteous remnant uh, to make a difference. And, you know, one of the ways that I've been challenged in my faith uh, just during these very challenging times to make a difference is in the life of my family. So as I'm watching the news and as I'm watching uh, chaos take place, hatred take place, it's been a great opportunity to talk with my family about those issues with a biblical perspective. And so that's one of the ways that I wanna be a righteous remnant and reflect God's perspective 
even in the midst of challenging times. What about you? I mean, I'm, I think that sounds fantastic. And, you know, I haven't been blessed with a family yet. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea of having someone to pour into is always a fantastic thing. Now, for me, just because of all the social distancing and separation, um, a lot of people that I would either, you know, sometimes I'll almost be more accountable because I had to keep other people accountable. Um, but having not having those uh, relationships around, the only person that's going to keep me accountable for my biblical learning, for my biblical growth, for growing in the Lord is myself. And so more than anything now, I like really have to focus on my own home workout to make sure that I'm staying fit in the Word. Because um, if I'm not going to do it, no one else is going to do it for me. And I also really have the deep-seated belief that whatever I'm going to end up doing on my own, like learning about God's Word, those are things that really stick. It's one of those things that when you, when you learn something, when you, when you actually go and do it with your own hands or you, you find it in the Word, man, it, it sings to you so much more than if I heard it in your sermon or Pastor Jeff. Those are great, but the times you find those things yourself, oh, it is like, oh, so like during this time of social distancing, I've had more of those moments. And I know as a Christian, maybe that could be an everyday thing, but... I, I still mess up too, so we're working on it. Great. So let's get to Samuel's birth. So you have Elkanah, and he's married to two women. He has two wives. Mm -hmm. And Hannah and Panina are his wives. Now, one is able to conceive, Panina. The other is not able to conceive, Hannah. Now, we see the reason why Hannah is not able to conceive. Now, many times there could be challenges and issues that people face, and we never fully know why that challenge, that issue is there. In this situation, we see the, re the reason why Hannah cannot conceive. It tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And so she's going uh, to the temple to give her offering. And uh, we see here that uh, her husband uh, gives her a double portion because he loved her. And it says, and the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 6, and because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. It's bad enough that you can't conceive. But then on top of the fact that you can't conceive, it says God's the reason why you can't conceive. But then you have this other person here that is agitating, making fun, rubbing it in your face year after year, the fact you can't have children. And we see that, again, God caused it. But God had a reason. God had something very unique for Hannah. Jacob, talked to me about what was God doing in the life of Hannah so unique where ultimately her pain, her challenge, was for something much bigger than she'd ever imagined. Talk to us about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of these things that, again, God is always working. He's always working whether we understand it or not. And we see that multiplied through all the Bible stories, you know, Ruth and Moses, etc. They're usually separate, separate from the people they're actually going to end up blessing um, until later on in the story. Um, but, you know, it tells us in Lamentations that the Lord's kindness never ceases. His compassions never fail. So Hannah knew this. And it was hard enough for her, too, as just being a woman at that time, that her whole worth really came from being able to bear children. Like, if you were a wife that had, had the inability to bear kids, you really didn't have much going for you. Um, and so she probably not only felt just the inability to have the, the children, but also just the self-worth issues as well. Um, and she could have gotten mad. She could have retaliated against uh, Panina. She could have gotten angry at God. Uh, there's a hundred different ways she could have responded, and yet she responded in the only way that she knew that would actually cause change. And that was to cry out to God. And she did that. And she would go to the, the temple with when her husband went in to give the offerings and she would cry and cry and pray and pray. 
so much so that even Eli the priest thought she was drunk uh, mm -hmm. because she was just praying so feverishly. And, uh, but she was like, no, I, this is just something that is so deep within my heart. Um, it, it says there in, in chapter 2 that she was a woman who poured out her soul before the Lord. And if anything you're going to learn from the life of Samuel, it starts right here with his mother. I mean, this is just how important mothers are. Um, it is, is the life of prayer. A prayer is so, so important because it's that personal relationship that you're having with God. You're talking with Him. You're bringing everything out before Him, just leaving it wide open. And that's exactly what Hannah did. She was barren. She was desperate. She had no, nothing else she could do. And she had all these ways that she could respond, but she responded in the only way, the only way that probably didn't make sense to the rest of the nation, and that was to talk to the Creator. And she did that. And God heard her. And God blessed her. And within a year from that time that she cried out at the temple, she had a son. And that son was Samuel. And she had promised to God that if she had had a son, that she would devote him to, devote him to the Lord. And she did. She took her most precious thing, the thing she wanted most in her life, a child, and she turned around and gave it back to God immediately and let Samuel now be part of the ministry service to where she could only see him once a year after that. Um, and that, man, you know, you want God to work in your life, but are you ready to get, make that sacrifice? Are you ready to give up the thing that's most precious to you? Because most likely the thing that's most precious to you is probably in the way. Mm -hmm. So now God took care of her. Like he ended up giving her some more kids down the line because he loved her. Mm -hmm. But uh, that gives us Samuel, who's now in the ministry, who's now working with Eli in Shiloh at the holy place. So Jacob, we don't know what the people that are listening to us today, what they're going through, whether college student, whether young adult, whether middle-aged adult, whether senior adult. We don't know uh, the situations that uh, those people are going through, and yet God knows. And what we can pick up from Samuel's story here, even through the life of his mom, is not only does God know, but he's asking us, he's drawing us to himself. And prayer is one of the most powerful things we can do in our time of need, in our time of confusion. And we've got a lot of things we know just culturally that are going on in our world right now that we can spend a lot of time talking about it. We can spend a lot of time debating about it. But at the end of the day, God's calling us to pray about it. Right. And so that is uh, just such a beautiful challenge that we see here. Well, Samuel's a young boy. We move from his birth to he's a young man, he's a young boy. And God's doing some unique things in Samuel's life as a young boy. You know, when there's someone that's a child that uh, acts much older than they actually are, we say they seem beyond their years. You read chapter 2 and you read chapter 3 of 1 Samuel and you say, Samuel is beyond his years and God's using him in some unique ways. Talk to us a little bit about some of the unique ways God's using this young boy. Well, so he's in the, he's in the, the temple ministry, the temple, you know, as, as it is, the place that they worship God. And so he's being taught all the priestly duties from Eli. He's being mentored by Eli. And... One thing that's kind of like an underlying thing here is if anything, he's learning obedience. Um, we see from, you know, upcoming story just how obedient he can be. And, you know, Spurgeon, he said in one of his sermons about this particular story is that, man, you know, an ounce of obedience is better than a ton of learning. And so, you know, he could have been up there and reading all the scrolls and he could answer every Bible trivia question there was. But more than anything, he was learning to be obedient. And so he was learning prayer and he was learning obedience. And I think that's really what set him up for success, especially with what happened next. This amazing story in 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli, verse 1 of chapter 3. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So setting up what you're about to share about Samuel and how God is using him as a young boy. This was during a time that the Bible says there weren't many visions and God speaking directly to his servants was very rare. Mm -hmm. 
And yet something very unique happened. What happened? So you have this, <clears throat> you have this nighttime story um, that Samuel is sleeping somewhere in the temple. We're not exactly sure where, but he's sleeping in the temple as he was nearby that if Eli, the high priest, needed something, he would yell for him and he could get to him. And so Samuel's sleeping and he hears his name, Samuel, Samuel. And so he immediately run, gets up, goes to check on Eli. Eli's like, mm, it's not me. Go back to bed, boy. You're, you're crazy. And this happens three times. Um, one thing to remember, too, you know, we all know if somebody yells us at the middle of the night, do we just get up and want to help them? No, we're like, what? I don't want anything. You know, just whatever, you know. Here, Samuel got up and he was obedient. And I think this obedience played a major role into this. Eli gets the idea that, hey, maybe there's more to this. Next time this happens, say, you know, hey, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And just those few words, we could, we could do a whole sermon on just that sentence, that prayer. It's one of the most perfect prayers in the Bible that speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And, you know, you can look at it different ways, that it's the prayer of a, of a child, um, the sense that, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. So speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Maybe it's the prayer of an anxious soul in the sense that you don't know what you're doing in life right now. You don't know what's going on. You, you don't know what to do next. Um, and you say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Please speak to me. Or maybe you are an earnest believer, like you are just trying to do everything you can do to help with the, the cause for the ministry. And so you're like saying, Lord, speak. I am listening. I am ready to go. I am ready to help. Or maybe you're in a time of difficult situation like we are right now and you don't know what to do next. And so you say, speak, Lord, your servant listening. It is such a simple prayer and yet it covers a wide gamut of all these things of what prayer is really about. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. If you go home tonight or you sleep in line in bed tonight and you don't know what to pray, there you go. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. If you mean that, God's going God's to speak to you. And he's going to show you things, and he's going to start guiding your life in a way that you will never understand. And that's what started here. Samuel's life, Samuel being moved by God, began at this moment. And the Bible kind of echoes that. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like here we see, we see the beginning of Samuel's growth, looking at my notes here. And we have this, you know, leadership influence at the very end of chapter 3 is... Well, here, let's even talk about the fact, even as you talk about his leadership influence, when you genuinely pray to God, essentially, when you're asking him to speak, you're also saying, yes, I'm willing to hear your voice. Yes, I'm willing to follow mm. what you have to say. It's a big deal when you put your yes on the table with God. Because He'll do in you and through you what you perhaps never thought was possible or what you never imagined. Because when God gets a hold of you, the supernatural is introduced. For sure. Samuel's a young boy, but his influence went well beyond what you would think a young boy. Talk to us a little bit about his influence and how it went well beyond just this situation here in this location. We see this in yeah. uh, the remaining verses there in 1 Samuel 3. At the end of chapter 3, yeah. I mean, I could give it, but the Bible puts it out the best way possible. 319, Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. It's a complete opposite than how the chapter started. In the sense where you barely heard things from the Lord, here it is, the Lord returned again to Shiloh because he was with Samuel. And that whole phrase, from Dan even to Beersheba, the best way to think about that is that's actually north and south. And it's like how we as Americans would say, from sea to shining sea in the sense that everyone knew in Israel that Samuel was something special. And that's, this was just as him as a child. So if he was just that well known as a child, man, everybody knew that God was moving in this little boy named Samuel. What could happen next? And what did happen next, Mark? Marcus? Well, you, you referenced it earlier that Israel has these ups 
and these downs, mm -hmm. times of obedience, times of disobedience. Well, you read the next couple of chapters in 1 Samuel, specifically chapters 4, chapters 5. You see, here's another downtime. Now, in these chapters, you see that Israel gets this bright idea that they're going to go to war with the Philistines. The problem is, God didn't tell them to go to war with the Philistines. Now, I think my sin can sound crazy. Your sin would sound crazy. Why would you possibly do that knowing you have a faithful God? This definitely doesn't look like it makes sense in that you're going to go to war and you're going to take the ark. You're going to take the ark of, of rep, representing God's presence. You're going to take that into a place where God didn't tell you to go. That's a lucky rabbit's foot. <laughs> we know the, what's going to happen here and ultimately they're defeated. The ark uh, gets captured and the people experience the silence of God. And the silence of God is echoed through uh, God not speaking to the people and Samuel's silence. Hmm. And so their disobedience leads to Samuel's absence, God's absence uh, as they pursue war with the Philistines and they experience defeat. But then there's God's grace, there's God's mercy, and we go to Samuel chapter 7. Now, <coughs> this is 20 years of silence. We read in chapter 7. But then Samuel's ministry continues. And we see God using Samuel now as an adult. Talk to us a little bit about God's ministry through Samuel uh, in his adult years. I am going to cliff note this for a second. Mm -hmm. If you want to read something fun, read those few chapters we skipped over of, of like five and six and stuff, God takes care of himself pretty uh, funnily. Like mm -hmm. God's God and God's going to take care of himself. So if you want to read a fun story, read that part when the Ark of the Covenant gets captured. It's great. <laughs> so back to Samuel. Um, 20 years, you know, he's been silent. He's been prepared. And so, you know, here they are. They're trying to figure out the Ark has been returned mm -hmm. by uh, miraculous means. Again, check out the story. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, they're like, hey, what are we going to do? They, it says in the house of Israel lamented before the Lord, after the Lord, like, we don't know what to do. Hey, it's the book of Judges all over again. And Samuel spoke to, this is 7-3, uh, and Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So right there, Samuel gets ministry in a nutshell. He says, it's not all about your outward appearance. What's the first thing he tells them to do? He tells them to change their heart, mm -hmm. which is an inward change. And so here they are always doing actions. We'll, let, we'll see how we have the Ark of the, the Covenant. We'll see how we do these offerings. And God, uh, Samuel's like, no, 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 no. Deal with your heart first and then follow it up with your outward actions. And so, you know, he, that shows some great leadership there that he gives them a very clear path to take and he gives them a chance to respond and then he helps correct them after that fact. You know, he becomes the judge. You know, a lot of times we see judge, we're like, oh, judge, rah, you know, smack the gavel. Judge is also a way to say just correcting. In the sense, if, if I'm judging you, it's like, okay, this is what you're doing, and here's how you need to correct it. doesn't mean I'm just saying, oh, you're, you're out of here. You know, it's, uh, he's correcting them, and he's doing it with love. I mean, he is probably an example of what we read in Ephesians 4 about how he speaks the truth in love. And... Uh, he, he does that, and he, he, he prays for them. Again, you see Samuel praying for the nation, and God forgives, and God starts getting back on track, and almost immediately the Philistines are routed, and we see this, this time of peace and prosperity that begins in Samuel's life or in the life of Israel because Samuel showed them how to get back on track. And Samuel keeps it up. He doesn't stop. If you make any comparison between Samuel and some of the other judges, one of the things is that everybody usually had to come to the judge to, to deal with their situation. And Samuel, well, he went and visited everybody. It talks, there's this verse about how he goes on a circuit, like in the sense that he goes and visits these towns regularly to help with the people. We're getting ready to fast forward to Samuel's later years where a lot, a lot of stuff happens, mm -hmm. but we can't pass up the fact of God doing these incredible things through Samuel, but he takes it seriously. And... 
But one of the ways he takes it seriously is he, he tells them and teaches them to remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I almost forgot it. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. ironic is that? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things, if you've ever heard me talk about anything, one of my favorite things is the word Ebenezer. And we're not talking Christmas Carol here. This is that song, like if you read, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, you know, Here I Raise Mine Ebenezer. This is where it comes from, is this passage right here that Samuel prays for the people, the Philistines are routed, and he sets up a stone, and he sets up, as he calls it, an Ebenezer, and says, thus far the Lord has helped us. And it's not the first time that something has happened in the Bible where they've set something up as saying, remember what's happened here. But the way he calls it, the stone of remembrance, thus far God has helped us. Because he wants them to remember that no matter what, down the road, something happens, they can look back, they can see this rock standing up saying, but this was the time that God helped us. This is the time that when I thought all else was failing, God was there. Because there's so much power to remembering what God has done. I mean, that's the Old Testament in a nutshell, is just remembering what God has done. And it also works against you, because if you say, oh, I'm going to remember what God has done, I'm going to set up this monument, down the road when you start complaining, well, God doesn't care, there's this stone saying, ah, but he does. And he's caring about you, and he cares about you right now. And thus far, God has helped us. Why would God stop now? He has promised us. And if we can take this word to add its words, we know that whatever he has promised, he will fulfill. So remember, like I have a personal stone myself. It doesn't have to be a stone. It could be something that you hang on your car or mirror or something like that, but something that you can see on a regular basis that reminds you that God has done something for you in your life because that's going to give you the strength and uh, passion to push on because God has never changed. His compassion never ceases. You know, that's a whole lesson in and of itself, the yes. whole issue of remembering it because you see it all throughout Pauline literature where he says, remember, remember. You see it in the Old Testament over and over reminding the Israelites, remember, remember, remember. And so um, that's a, a theological concept. That's a biblical concept that God asks us. Learn how to remember. Mm. Now, leading yourself, leading others toward God's purposes is not easy. We fast forward to uh, Samuel's later years. And a lot took place in his later years. Some significant events took place in his later years. And we read about some of those things in 1 Samuel chapter 8. I want to read verses 1 through 3 of what's taking place in Samuel's later years. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in, the, in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so you, you see here that um, Samuel's sons he has to, to deal with in his later years, and it's not good. Talk to us about Samuel's sons. I mean, we don't, we don't know a lot about him. Um, I mean, that and another couple of verses, but we basically see that, you know, Samuel, here he was a role model, and yet for some reason it didn't translate down, down to his sons. We don't know if that's Samuel's fault. We don't know if there's something else that's happened. But it, it, whatever happened made an impact, and they were just not the man that Samuel was, and they were very easily corrupted by the people around them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the people used it as an excuse exactly. because there's another major transition that's about to take place um, that has rejection written all over it. Of course, uh, Samuel takes it as a rejection, but God has something to say to Samuel about what the people are actually doing. Um, you have the scenario where the people see Samuel's sons and their disobedience. It also says that not only, so the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at, at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as the other nations have. So they say, number one, your sons are disobedient. They say, number two, um, 
we want to be like everyone else. And then we see in this passage, it says Samuel was old. So they know it's time to start looking for another leader. But at the end of the day, they wanted to be just like everybody else. And they ask for a king. Talk to us about this major transition that's going to take place, that's going to impact Israel, that's going to impact God's people uh, for many years to come. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's why Samuel can be so important, too, among the judges, because he's basically the last judge. He is the transition. He is the kingmaker as, as what will be happening in the near future. And, you know, it has been said that sometimes the strongest people come out of a transition, but no one ever knows it. No one ever sees them. But it says during that time of transition that somebody really steps up and they really lead the path. And Samuel did that here. And um, it, it's, it was just very sad and hurtful to him because here he'd lived his whole life in front of Israel from when he was a young boy to now, living the way with God in his ear, constantly telling the nation, hey, this is how you live. He visited with these people day in and day out. He loved on them. He judged them. He corrected them. He did everything that he was supposed to do. And yet here we are at the end of the day, the end of his life, and it kind of just feels like, did you guys not learn anything? You know, God set you apart to be a nation so that everyone could look around and be like, what's up with this nation of Israel? Why are they successful? Why are they important? Who is this God that they worship? Why do they live life in such a different way from us? So that those questions would then turn into, how can I get to know that God? I mean, that's how we as Christians are supposed to live. And yet here we are at the end of this, and they, the only concern they have is that we want to be like everyone around us. So give us a king because that's what's important. And, you know, that's got to be a dagger to the heart of Samuel. I mean, so much so that the Lord himself even has to comfort him a little bit, if you want to pick up from there. Hmm. The interesting thing is about what we're sharing now is it's actually what we started with. Hannah set Samuel apart yep. for God's purposes. God's desire for his people was for them to be set apart for his purposes. But time and time again, the people said, I want to be like everybody else. Mm. I think that's a great way to kind of culminate at least our first lesson on the life of Samuel. Are you like everybody else? Or can it be said that you're living a life that's set apart, that's unique, that people, when they look at my life, when they look at your life, when they look at your life, they see something different. Even for a lost person that maybe can't fully explain what it is, it's unique and it's different. God is calling us to live a life that's set apart. Our prayer for you, our prayer for us, is that we would be a unique people. Uh, we would be a people that would stand out because of our authentic relationship with Christ. Well, we've just touched the surface yeah. on the life of Samuel. There's so much more. So how about if we do another lesson? And so, uh, Jacob, will you do another lesson with me? Sure. I'm here for wherever you want. Great. So you can look for a second lesson on the life and character of Samuel coming soon. But we pray that this has blessed you, encouraged you in your faith. It's been a blessing to be able to join with you today as we talk about the life and character of Samuel. We hope you have a great week. God bless you.